David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is, well, we'll pretend that it is Wednesday, October 5th, 2022, and that it is indeed time for another show. I mean, the time has arrived. It's just that I haven't. I've uh, decided to make an attempt, at least, at recording a little bit just to keep you company. I know I'll be away from the microphone on Wednesday, today. Uh, and I thought, oh, you know, you might be bored. And I thought this would maybe an opportunity to read something that I've had in pocket that you might have had a chance to read. One of these long-ish, long, long ass, you might say, uh, New York Times articles. Uh, and uh, one that they've gussied up nicely with some visual presentation, uh, which I often find unnecessary, but which I think they've actually made some pretty good use of here, which means we'll try and describe how they've done that on the radio, which is a particular challenge. But it's a long piece, and it's the sort of thing that could take all day if I was running a normal show. And of course, I'm not running one, and it still may take all day. But I feel, I don't know, somehow more justified in doing that. Well, one, because uh, that wouldn't mean intruding on Joan's time or Greg's time, even though some people may say it's my time as well, because I'm there too. But it seems like a longer block makes it possible to get through something like this. And I don't even know if we'll get through it. It's very long, but it seems to be very important. And I thought, well, I don't have to also don't have to sit around and watch the feedback come in on Twitter like, hey, this is boring. Move on to something else. So I can force you to take your vitamins, eat your oatmeal, as they say. I don't think anybody actually says that anymore, but uh, this stuff should be good for you, whether you like it or not. I don't know. We'll see what we think of this reporting, but this seems important. This runs under the headline of, uh, oh, how did they, uh, how did they put it? They legitimized the myth of a stolen election, those nasty Republicans that did this, and reaped the rewards. Like there shouldn't be any rewards, right? But here they are. Uh, and by that, I mean in Congress. So what's going on here? Well, uh, in this strange visual and long scrolling presentation that the New York Times gives us, what first comes up uh, planted among the signatures of members of Congress who signed on to the objections to the counting of the electoral vote on January 6, 2021, floats the opening lines of the story. A majority of House Republicans last year voted to challenge the Electoral College and upend the presidential election. And as you scroll, more names, more signatures appear on the screen. That action signaled ahead of the vote in signed petitions would change the direction of the party. And you got to scroll for a little while longer. Then you finally get to that headline. They legitimized the myth of a stolen election and reaped the rewards. On the day the Capitol was attacked, 139 Republicans in the House voted to dispute the Electoral College count. This is how they got there. Hmm. Well, this is presented under the bylines of Steve Eder, or Eder, I don't know, E-D-E-R, David D. Kirkpatrick, and Mike McIntyre, and begins this way. Five days after the attack on the Capitol last year, the Republican members of the House of Representatives braced for a backlash. Two-thirds of them, 139 in all, had been voting on January 6, 2021 to dispute the Electoral College count that would seal Donald J. Trump's defeat, just as rioters determined to keep the president in power stormed the chamber. Now, one lawmaker after another warned during a conference call that unless Republicans demanded accountability, like of themselves and the rioters, voters would punish them for inflaming the mob. Do you, I mean, you knew that this happened in your head. You remember that this happened, but it has been astonishing, hasn't it? The U-turn that they've taken, and it's illustrated with this vignette, if you will. Uh, a quote first, I want to know if we are going to look at how we got here internally 
within our own party and hold people responsible, said Representative Nancy Mace of South Carolina, who still presents herself as a moderate in all of this, according to a recording of the call obtained by the New York Times. When another member implored the party to unite behind a clarifying message that Mr. Trump had truly lost, Representative Kevin McCarthy, do you recognize him? He's an important guy, of California, the Republican leader, emphatically agreed. We have to. Imagine being that emphatic about anything from Kevin McCarthy and then just changing your mind, going the opposite direction, and going hard, too. More than 20 months later, the opposite has happened. The votes to reject the election results have become a badge of honor within the party, in some cases even a requirement for advancement, as doubts about the election have come to define what it means to be a Trump Republican, really a Republican at all at this point. The most far-reaching of Mr. Trump's ploys to overturn his defeat the objections to the Electoral College results by so many House Republicans did more than any lawsuit, speech, or rally to engrave in the party orthodoxy the myth of a stolen election. Their actions that day legitimized Mr. Trump's refusal to concede, gave new life to his claims of conspiracy and fraud, and lent institutional weight to doubts about the central ritual of American democracy. I sometimes spend a little bit of time wondering how it is that so many Republicans have come to believe this myth or any other myth. I mean, right, right now, my obsession is with how did so many of these idiots come to believe the litter box lie? Like, I just can't understand that one. This one, I have less trouble understanding. If 139 members of the House of Representatives get behind something, I mean, that's a, that's a minority by a long shot, to be sure. And it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't do anything. If 139 members get behind something, that's just not enough to get anything done. But 139 members in suits and ties and member pins and pant suits and whatever else people might be wearing, that that makes a compelling image. I'm not alone. 139 members of Congress, our leading citizens, say that this is true. So, you know, this is pretty important. Yet the riot engulfing the Capitol so overshadowed the debate inside that the scrutiny of that day has overlooked how Congress reached that historic vote. A reconstruction by the Times revealed more than simple rubber stamp loyalty to a larger-than-life leader. Instead, the orchestration of the House objections was a story of shrewd salesmanship and calculated double-talk, set against a backdrop of demographic change across the country that has widened the gulf between the parties. While most House Republicans had amplified Mr. Trump's claims about the election in the aftermath of his loss, only the right flank of the caucus continued to loudly echo Mr. Trump's fraud allegations in the days before January 6th, the Times found. More Republican lawmakers appeared to seek a way to placate Mr. Trump and his supporters without formally endorsing his extraordinary allegations. In formal statements justifying their votes, about three-quarters relied on the arguments of a low-profile Louisiana congressman, Representative Mike Johnson, with that amazing, outstanding name, Mike Johnson, the most important architect of the Electoral College objections. Bet you didn't know that. I certainly didn't. On the eve of the January 6th votes, he presented colleagues with what he called a third option. Everyone wants a third way. huh? He faulted the way some states had changed voting procedures during the pandemic, saying it was unconstitutional without supporting the outlandish claims of Mr. Trump's most vocal supporters. His Republican critics called it a Trojan horse that allowed lawmakers to vote with the president while hiding behind a more defensible case. Even lawmakers who had been among the noisiest Stop the Steal firebrands took refuge in Mr. Johnson's narrow and lawyerly claims, though his nuanced argument was lost on the mob storming the Capitol, and over time it was the vision of the rioters that a democratic conspiracy had defrauded America that prevailed in many Republican circles. That has made objecting politically profitable. Republican partisans have rewarded objectors with grassroots support, 
paths to higher office, and campaign money. Corporate backers have reopened their coffers to lawmakers they once denounced as threats to democracy, and almost all the objectors seeking re-election are now poised to return to Congress next year when Republicans are, still according to the conventional wisdom, I guess, expected to hold a majority in the House. And of course, if that actually comes true, I mean, what a blow to democracy in general. But, I mean, this specific fact makes it all the more egregious. But you see, I mean, I think you see, right? What's happening here is that they come up with this legalistic explanation. I didn't think there was fraud. I just think that the changes that were made in voting procedures were unconstitutional, but because of a fraudulent theory of of the Constitution and the authority that, uh, well, basically to the independent legislature theory, where... 200 years of understanding of what it means to con- to uh, determine the method of holding an election by a state legislature, which would then delegate the, you know, brass tax details of how the day would go off to elections authorities, was somehow now invalid and unconstitutional. Standing, you know, all of our understanding upside down, turning it on its head and saying, well, you know, I'm just asking questions. Is this unconstitutional? I mean, there's good reason to think that it is. I mean, there's fantastic reason to think that it's not. And there's, you know, subpar reasoning for thinking that it is. But could we convince five robes to think otherwise? Well, maybe so. Objectors are set to fill the Republican leadership posts and head a majority of the committees. All eight Republicans in the House seeking higher office voted against the Electoral College tally, while a dozen Republican lawmakers who broke with Trump have either lost primaries or chosen to retire. Playing to Trump loyalists, many across the party have made a slogan of, quote unquote, election integrity a dog whistle perpetuating the erroneous belief that Mr. Trump's victory was stolen, as one dissenting Republican put it in a party meeting. More than a third of objectors joined a new election integrity caucus, which advocates stricter voting requirements and has featured speakers who supported Mr. Trump's efforts to fight his loss. Now, at this point, they have embedded one of those uh, visual enhancements of the article which I think is actually of some interest here. What they have is, I guess, the 139 objectors in the House, their their headshots, their pictures, and the years in which they first entered Congress. The earliest one, I don't know if you if you scroll over them, we'll tell you who it is. Yes, Congressman, is it Mike Rogers of Kentucky, who uh, entered Congress um, by far the first, the longest serving of the bunch, in 1980. But I guess this thing is meant to illustrate he's the one and only from 1980 that joined the objectors. One and only one of the 1992 electeds is represented here as well. That's Ken Calvert from California. They just give the last names, but a few of these guys have been around long enough that I can remember their first name. 1994, the Gingrich Revolution. Everyone remembers that. There are only two who entered the House after the 1994 election, Steve Chaboat and uh, Luke, who's, what's Lucas's last, uh, first name, um, of Oklahoma, Congressman Lucas. Dang, I can't remember. But anyway, so much for the Republican Revolution of 1994. 1996, there are two. 2000, there are two. One from 2001, a special election, I guess. Uh, 2002 is here. Has, uh, that's the biggest one so far. 2002 brings one, two, three, four, five, six of them. And then the numbers start to pick up. And the, the visualization that they give you is all 139 are there. Uh, but at first, only the ones through who joined the House through 2008 have their pictures, you know, uh, brought up fully. Everyone else is ghosted back and, you know, grayed out. And then as you scroll and keep going down the page, the years advance and more and more people pop up. And it's meant to illustrate that the by far the greatest part, if not the majority, and I think it might even be the majority of the members who joined in the objections 
uh, were elected to the House in 2016 or later. That is to say, the ones with the least experience in the House were the most likely to involve themselves in this because they didn't care about or have, had ever had a time to uh, acclimate themselves to the norms of governance, perhaps. But also because there's always a lot of turnover in the House. Anyway, uh, above all of this, there's some uh, explanation of the timeline. And it says here, the arrival of the objectors in the House over the years traces the rightward shift of the Republican Party. And as you scroll, it says, many of them were elected during the rise of the anti-establishment Tea Party. And they come up in the 2010 and thereafter crew, I guess. And uh, maybe the the uh, text here is underlined, elected during the rise of the anti-establishment Tea Party is underlined in, oh, I don't know, is that orange or something? And it looks like they give the orange tin to that crew from 2010. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 of them. Then 2012, 13, and 14, and 15 are represented here. Another, oh, I don't know, let's say another 15 or so uh, before we get around to 2016 when the vast majority of them come on board. Scrolling on, the largest swath of objectors was elected with Donald Trump and during his presidency, reflecting how he put his stamp not only on the executive branch, but also on Congress. And then everybody else lights up for all of this. All the rest of the 139. The article then continues, All the Republicans who objected say they were following an example set by Democrats who objected to electoral college results in 1968, 2000, 2004, and 2016. In each case, Republicans accused Democrats of damaging democracy and, quote, thwarting the will of the people, though only small numbers of Democrats joined in those objections, which all came after the losing Democratic presidential candidate had already conceded. Mr. Trump only relinquished his claim to the White House the day after Republicans, House Republicans and rioters failed to block the Electoral College count. But several Republican lawmakers argued that the scale of their vote to object would do more to encourage legislators of either party to mimic the tactic, potentially upending the peaceful transfer of executive power if an aggrieved party controls Congress. Mm hmm. It is a horrible precedent, said Representative Tom Rice, a five-time Republican representing conservative Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, who was the only objector to express any regrets and lost a primary this summer. Some continue to recast their objections. Legislators in Democratic-leaning territory who once thundered about defending the Republic now insist they meant only a legalistic protest against certain COVID-19 rule changes, like Representative Lee Zeldin, the Republican candidate for governor in heavily Democratic New York, who railed in a January 6th floor speech about his outrage over, quote, confirmed evidence-filled issues in the 2020 vote. But many have moved the other way, more fully embracing Mr. Trump's claims than they did in the aftermath of the riot. Representative Mark Wayne Mullen of Oklahoma, a former mixed martial arts fighter, experienced the center of the maelstrom. He broke off the leg of a wooden stand as a weapon to help defend the floor of the house. Then, watched from a few feet away as a Capitol Police officer shot and killed one of the assailants. Amid the wreckage of the violence, the congressman justified his objection by hewing closely to Mr. Johnson's lawyerly nuance. But now, as the favored candidate for a Senate seat in Oklahoma, Mr. Mullen is more categorical. Was Mr. Trump, quote, cheated out of the election, a moderator asked in a recent televised debate? Mr. Mullen replied, Absolutely. This next section, a fig leaf intellectual argument. The House vote to formalize presidential election results is customarily ceremonial. But in 2021, Mr. Trump changed that, demanding, like no president before, that House Republicans reject the results from several states. On the eve of the vote, Representative Liz Cheney of Wyoming then chairwoman of the House Republican Conference, called an unusual meeting in the congressional auditorium. 
I didn't even know they had a congressional auditorium. But okay, her goal was to convince her fellow Republicans that the Constitution gave Congress no role in deciding presidential elections. And in the days before the meeting, she also distributed a 21-page summary of court rulings, many by Trump-appointed judges that found no evidence of meaningful fraud. Representative Chip Roy, a former top official in the Texas Attorney General's office and a staunch conservative, made the same case warning that, quote, history will judge this moment. If a majority of Republicans vote to reject the electors, it will irrevocably empower Congress to take over the selection of presidential electors, he said, according to one of several recordings included in the audio version of This Will Not Pass, a book by uh, Jonathan Martin and Alexander Burns, who covered the 2020 election for The Times. Doing so, Mr. Roy continued, will almost certainly guarantee that a Democrat House would vote to reject the electors of Texas or any of your states based on our use of voter ID, our failure to adopt mail-in ballots, our choice of voting locations, or otherwise. He also pointed out that Republicans had just voted to seat themselves, accepting the tallies of their individual congressional races despite their suspicions. Another good point lost on them, of course, because they're gimmitarian. But he does make a good point, except for the fact that Democrats actually don't do that sort of thing. And if they did do that sort of thing, it would be attacked as tit for tat and retaliation for 2021 and all of those sorts of things and uh, rejected as legitimate in any sort of way, both by Republicans and, I think importantly, the so-called liberal media. But at any rate, others however, in this meeting, reminded colleagues that their constituents overwhelmingly believed Mr. Trump had won in a landslide. They they also believe kids are pooping in litter boxes, but whatever. Don't anybody fool themselves into thinking you're going to be able to make a constitutional argument that your Lincoln Day dinners, said Representative Larry Bouchon. I don't even know Bouchon or Buckshon. Does he say Buckshon? B-U-C-S-H-O-N. No idea. Of Indiana. You can ask around in Indiana. They know. According to the recording, Mr. Johnson of Louisiana offered a third way. Members could simply accept the results, as Ms. Cheney and Mr. Roy insisted, or they could vote to object because of the fraud concerns raised by the president and his allies. But Mr. Johnson argued that they could take a different path, object based on what he called constitutional infirmity Hmm. the constitution stipulates that state legislatures set election rules yet some state officials without asking their legislatures because they've never needed to before loosened restrictions on mail-in or early voting to deal with the pandemic and also by the way many uh state legislatures were already uh long out of session when it became obvious that there would need to be adaptations to account for COVID-19, and they would have had no interest in coming back, especially in most of the Republican-controlled states, because that would just mean that Democrats would be allowed to cast their votes legally without risking illness and death, and that's not what they wanted. But aside from all of that, for 200 and something years, it was pretty well understood that The choice for the legislature was either to hold an election to select uh, members of the Electoral College or do something else, whether it was drawing names for a hat or appointing them directly through action of the state legislature or whatever. It was the method of the selection that was up to the legislature. The particulars could and always had been delegated to uh, lesser authorities inside of each state. But there you have it. The Constitution stipulates that state legislatures set election rules, yet some state officials, without asking legislatures, had changed the rules uh, or the uh, parameters of voting anyway, I would say, to deal with the pandemic. That, they said, was unconstitutional and grounds to reject the election results from those states, Mr. Johnson argued. That's why I had to throw that in there. Uh, that uh, they said, right? The the text actually reads, that was unconstitutional on grounds to reject the election results from those states, Mr. Johnson argued. Makes the same point, but I wanted to make it right away because it's it doesn't mean it's unconstitutional. It's not grounds to reject the election results. He's wrong. He's making it up. I feel like you have to say that right away. 
The notion that Congress might have a say about the authority of state legislatures was unorthodox, especially among conservatives who emphasize state autonomy. But Mr. Johnson was well cast to make the case, telling colleagues he had studied up on the electoral issue more than when I first became a constitutional lawyer 20 years ago, according to previously unreported portions of the recording. Uh, I mean, maybe he is, but I mean, what, Ann Coulter says she's a constitutional lawyer. Uh, even what's her name? The uh, lunatic who was the traffic court uh, lawyer who then became Trump's lawyer for the campaign says uh, she, what's it, El Jenna Ellis? She says she's a constitutional scholar too. It happens. Lots of people are constitutional scholars. Guess what? I am. Ta-da. Terrific. Well, anyway, uh, where were we? Oh, yes, right. A boyish-looking 50-year-old with dimpled cheeks and rimless glasses. He, and we're talking here again about Mr. Johnson here, Mike Johnson of Louisiana. He made his name as a litigator for the Alliance Defending Freedom, a conservative counterweight to the American Civil Liberties Union. When Louisiana was defending its ban on same-sex marriage, Mr. Johnson twice argued its case at the state Supreme Court. His connections on the right helped him leapfrog in his second term to head the Republican Study Committee, a caucus that disseminates conservative policy research to nearly 160 members. Combining hardline views with a gentle style has been his hallmark. To show support for racial equality, he has told audiences that he and his wife adopted a black teenager they met through an evangelical youth group, like the movie The Blind Side, but without the NFL prospects, he has quipped. Hardy har. He once shared the story with a mostly Democratic audience at a congressional hearing on slavery reparations, and he was supposed surprised to hear boos as he spoke. He later recounted to the Council for National Policy an assembly of con that's some, by the way, yeah, I think we all remember, do we all remember the Council for National Policy and all of its arch conservative, uh, alternative facts loving weirdos that run the place? Well, anyway, he was surprised to hear booze, he told the Council for National Policy, an assembly of conservative donors known for its strict secrecy. I had my feelings surgically removed back in the 80s, he joked, according to a recording of the event, and then suggested the hearing had been packed with Black Panthers, yes, who disapproved of the mixing of races. I'm sure that's who it was. The Black Panther Party dissolved decades ago, and the jeers appeared to come at other moments in his remarks. Oh, that's interesting, too. During Mr. Trump's first impeachment for trying to squeeze favors from Ukraine. And remember, they're involved in a war? Yeah. Mr. Johnson defended the president on television so energetically that he was invited to join his defense team. Of course, the guy who wasn't watching television, right, during the riot, saw his uh, future defender on TV. And on November 8th, 2020, the day after Joe Biden gave a victory speech, the president called again, wanting to vent Mr. Johnson said in an interview with the Times, we have been cheated and all that. He believes that to his core today. Mr. Johnson's public statements suggest that he initially agreed. There is still reason for hope that Mr. Trump might win, he told conservative Louisiana talk radio hosts a week after the election, citing, quote, credible allegations of fraud and irregularity, charges that voting machines had been rigged, had Quote, a lot of merit, he asserted in another radio interview. When the president says the election is rigged, that's what he's talking about, that the fix was in, Mr. Johnson added. And then he found out he was wrong later and came up with uh, a way to move the goalposts, I guess, is what we're getting to. Some of his closest political allies, especially Representative Jim Jordan of Ohio, a relationship Mr. Johnson has described as, quote, like Batman and Robin, hmm. Keep, uh, kept up the cheating claims even after courts and Mr. Trump's attorney general had debunked them because he's a constitutional scholar, you know. Anyway, there was fraud on top of the unconstitutional way they ran the election, Mr. Jordan declared on Fox Business on January 5th, 2021. Yet Mr. Johnson now says he never bought the claims of massive fraud. I never egged on any of that, he said. I was never in that other camp any time, 
ever. Liar! 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 I mean, I couldn't put it any better myself, honestly. That, that's ridiculous. We just, well, you know we just heard those quotes. I was like a lone wolf crying in the wilderness. Guys, you don't have to worry about any of that, he said in an interview. They violated the Constitution. So he's going to set it all right with his fake theory. Democrats, seeing an advantage, have long pushed for easier balloting, just as Republicans have favored tighter regulations. Still, even if state officials loosened the rules in good faith, but did not receive the required legislative approval, Mr. Johnson said, it's the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine. If the process is broken, it cannot produce good fruit, as unpopular as that may be. I've never really heard the sort of generalized fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine. I, I, I know about it from Fourth Amendment doctrine that like the uh, anything seized in an illegal search would be fruit of the poisonous tree and you can't bring it in as evidence no matter how tempting it may be as fruit. But uh, And I guess it makes some sense to generalize it to all sorts of any sort of illegal activity or unconstitutional activity that yields something would be similarly fruit of a poisonous tree. But I've never heard it used in quite this way. If you are convinced the Constitution was violated in the process, and I'm not, thank you very much, but if you are convinced that the Constitution was violated in the process, I am not sure how the set of electors could then be deemed acceptable, he added, noting that the Supreme Court has agreed to hear a case on the relative power of state legislatures and courts over election rules. I mean, it has. They may eventually rule in his favor, but really all he's saying here is, I have this weird theory, and by the way, the Supreme Court might consider my theory. Now, they might reject my theory as stupid, but I also know that it's 6-3 Republicans versus Democrats on the Supreme Court, so we're likely to win, not because it has real merit, but because it's in the bag. The fix is in. Republicans are going to vote this way on the Supreme Court, and that's not the same thing as having the right answer, and that bothers me. Many legal experts sympathetic to his argument still say Congress does not have authority to rule on the constitutionality of a state's election procedures, especially after voters have cast ballots. What's more, the total number of ballots affected by pandemic rule changes would not have undone the results in Pennsylvania and other contested states. So it shouldn't matter, essentially. Even so, in early December 2020, the Texas Attorney General filed a long-shot appeal citing an array of unproven claims of fraud and other irregularities and asking the U.S. Supreme Court to invalidate the Pennsylvania results on similar constitutional grounds. Mr. Johnson draft a supporting brief that focused on the constitutional argument. As chairman of the Republican Study Committee, he pushed its members to sign the brief and he also wrote an email to all Republican lawmakers warning in bold red letters that Mr. Trump would be tracking their response. He said he will be anxiously awaiting the final list to review, he wrote. And here is that passage embedded right uh, in the article. This is the, uh, the email. Dear friends, President Trump called me this morning to express his great appreciation for our effort to file an amicus brief in the Texas case on behalf of concerned members of Congress. He specifically asked me to contact all Republican members of the House and Senate today and request that all join on to our brief. He said he will be anxiously awaiting the final list to review. It's like one of his fundraising emails. You're missing from our list. The simple objective of our brief is to affirm for the court and for our constituents back home our serious concerns with the integrity of the election system. We are not seeking to independently litigate the particular allegations of fraud in our brief. That is not our place as Amici. We will merely state our belief that the broad scope of the various allegations and irregularities in the subject states merits careful, timely review by the Supreme Court. So many House, so, uh, how will they put it here? So many House Republicans have wanted to weigh in on the record somewhere, and this may be, well be the last opportunity except for the riot. I am hoping to circulate the brief draft to 
all members interested by this afternoon and file the final brief as soon as possible by tomorrow morning at latest. Please let me know ASAP if you want to be included on that list of interested parties. Onward, signed Mike. That's the message from Johnson to the rest. The lawyer for the House Republican leadership told Mr. Johnson that his arguments were unconstitutional. Your your argument that what the states are doing is unconstitutional is unconstitutional. Uh, Okay, well, uh, we're going to do it anyway. That, according to three people involved in the conversations. And Ms. Cheney, also a lawyer, called the brief embarrassing. Mr. McCarthy, the Republican leader, told members that he refused to sign, the three people said. Nonetheless, Mr. Johnson pushed ahead and filed the brief on December 10th with 105 lawmakers as co-signers. And within a day, he had added 20 more, including Mr. McCarthy. Huh. Later, at the caucus meeting on January 5th, 2021, Mr. Johnson suggested the signers, in effect, had signaled their support for declaring constitutional infirmity as grounds for objecting. Most of the signers did exactly that. And here embedded is a tweet about the brief uh, from Mike Johnson embedded in the story. Proud to lead over 100 of my colleagues in filing an amicus brief to express our concern with the integrity of the 2020 election and our election system in the future. We believe this suit filed by Texas, supported by 17 other states, merits full and careful consideration by SCOTUS. And this is just another layer upon the layer of what we were discussing before. A hundred, 17 states plus 100 members of Congress. Again, quite a suit and tie caucus. It must be serious and real. Ms. Cheney, through a spokeswoman, declined to comment. But three colleagues said she had called Mr. Johnson's role extraordinarily destructive, noting that his image as an ultra-conservative constitutional lawyer had convinced members who would never have followed outliers like Representative Lauren Boebert of Colorado or Representative Murdery Trader Green of Georgia. It was a fig leaf intellectual argument. Representative Peter Meyer, a Michigan Republican who voted to impeach the president and then lost a primary this summer, said of the procedural justification. But that was what a lot of the objectors who were trying to make a plausible argument were hanging their hat on, he added, noting that within the chamber, very few were still arguing by then that the election was stolen. Hmm. Next up, the heart and soul of America. South Carolinians, demanding that Mr. Rice object to the election results, had been jamming the phones at his congressional office for weeks, and one day, in the lead-up to the January 6th vote, he answered a call himself. This is... Uh, they just begin referring to him. But this is uh, illustrated with a picture of Representative Tom Rice uh, as the only objector to express any regrets and then lost the primary. He was introduced earlier in the story. So he answered a call himself. She just lit into me for 30 minutes about how there were truckloads of absentee ballots unsigned that were accepted. All these allegations you read in QAnon, Mr. Rice said in an interview. It was a very, very high intent. Oh, it was very, very high intensity at that time. A former Myrtle Beach tax lawyer and accountant, Mr. Rice, 65, had been elected to local office with the Tea Party wave in 2010 and took Congress two years later. At a Trump campaign event, he called the 2020 election a battle for the heart and soul of America predicted the Democrats would not, quote, play fair and urged Republicans to get out every vote. He carried the district by 24 points, even besting Mr. Trump's margin. But of course, do please note that he, uh, you know, rode the Tea Party wave into power and then found out that the monster was in control of him. Boo hoo. Mr. Rice is a typical objector in many ways. They are disproportionately white, male and Christian whether compared with the general public or with Congress as a whole. Out of the 139 House lawmakers, 17 are women, 7 black or Latino, and 2 Jewish. Three, by the way, have died since they cast their votes, and one has resigned from Congress. I don't know exactly what that's supposed to mean, but hey, it's there. Because of partisan gerrymandering and a decades-long sorting of Americans into like-minded communities— North or South, urban or rural, 
all but a half dozen objectors represent districts so solidly Republican that a primary challenge is the only meaningful electoral contest they may ever face, even though more than one third come from blue or battleground states. That'll tell you a little bit about gerrymandering. Like other members of Congress, many pursued professional careers before moving to Capitol Hill as accountants, lawyers, doctors, dentists, i.e., you know, I would say respectable people, people in suits, people you can believe, upstanding pillars of the community. My dentist would never lie to me about the Constitution. I mean, I don't think he would, but I mean, I don't know if I would trust him about the Constitution necessarily, but some people would. He's a doctor. Three dozen have military experience and more than half hold an advanced degree, including three with PhDs in, uh, by the way, those PhDs are in animal nutrition. It's all important stuff. British history. Okay. And public policy. Excellent. But again, you know, suit and tie syndrome. About 18, Ms. Bobert and Mr. Mullen among them never earned a traditional four year degree, according to their congressional bios. And as I understand it, uh, Bobert, uh, might have finished high school with a GRE, but, uh, I don't know. Or what is that? Uh, or, um, GED, not the GRE. GRE is one of the tests, uh, post collegiate. All right. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, because she's done it now. So, okay. She's a high school graduate. Following the pattern of the larger Republican caucus, about half were first elected on Mr. Trump's coattails. About a third had not held prior elected office, though some, like Mr. Rice, reside in cities, they often live in more rural locations. Many represent districts where racial and demographic change is churning more swiftly than in other Republican areas. Compared with the national average, their districts have a higher percentage of white people with lower household incomes and levels of education. But in comparison with other Republicans, the objectors represent districts where the white portion of the population is decreasing faster relative to other racial or ethnic groups, according to a Times analysis of census data from over the past two decades. Interesting. Of the 10 Republicans representing districts with the steepest relative declines in the white population, eight were objectors. Not the most fantastic record in the world, 8 of 10, I mean, but uh, it's still an interesting demographic analysis, something to look at, consider. Some scholars argue that race helped drive the dispute over the 2020 election. The best predictor of Republicans hating Democrats is the level of racial resentment, said Liliana Mason, a professor at Johns Hopkins University who studies polarization and public opinion. Her research, she said, shows that as the two parties have become more identified with race, animosity between them has increased sharply, with about 70% of people in each of the parties now calling their counterparts a threat to the country, and about 60% calling them, quote, evil. Some Democrats have said they see racial bias in Mr. Trump's claims of widespread election fraud in cities like Atlanta, Detroit, and Philadelphia, where there are high concentrations of black voters. But Representative Byron Donalds of Florida, one of the two black objectors, described such suggestions as ignorant and meant to, quote, gaslight voters as opposed to having a legitimate conversation on the merits. Among other things, Mr. Trump and his allies have claimed that allowing people to vote early and easing access to mail-in ballots enabled fraud. Anytime you increase and you use the mail system in this country for voting, it's going to be rife with fraud, said Representative Troy Nails of Texas. There are entire states that vote by mail, but hey, whatever. Even so, the Times found most of the objectors with publicly available voting records took advantage of absentee or early voting provisions when they cast their ballots in the 2020 election. Mr. Nails was among them. All four objectors from Arizona, some of the most outspoken advocates for the debunked fraud claims, capitalized on the state's long-established early voting rule, which the Arizona Republican Party has unsuccessfully sought to dismantle. Mr. Rice also cast an absentee ballot. And as a matter of fact, there's a little graphic in here. How the objectors voted in a 2020 presidential election, 50% of them voted absentee or early. 
Only 18% of them voted in person on Election Day, and another 32% of them it is unknown. Now, that may bolster the ranks of those who voted in person, or it may make the overwhelming option in favor of absentee or early voting. I don't know. We'll see. But even if they all voted for in person, let's see, 32, then it, then we would have 50-50. Uh, which ain't a great record for people who are hanging their hat on the unconstitutionality uh, and uh, of, of early voting and saying that it's rife with fraud. Anyway, in an interview, he said he had listened with concern when Sidney Powell, Looney Tunes Fruit Loop that she is, one of Mr. Trump's lawyers, promised a titanic onslaught of lawsuits about a big tech conspiracy to hide his landslide victory. Mr. Rice was convinced otherwise, however, when Attorney General William P. Barr said about two weeks later that he had found no evidence of significant fraud. Republican members of Congress wanted to believe that the Republican president was not lying to them, Mr. Rice said. Ms. Powell, he said, was a crackpot. That's a quote. Still, as phones in his office rang nonstop with calls from constituents demanding that he object, Mr. Rice was drawn into Mr. Johnson's solution. Legislative authority over elections was a legitimate constitutional issue, Mr. Rice concluded. Mike is the one who brought that to my attention. Now here, embedded uh, in the piece are, what, looks like three tweets from Ted Budd, Mo Brooks, and Byron Donalds, uh, I guess, signing on to the, uh, what, what are they signing? The pledges to object to the state's electors. So I, I don't know whether that's the objection, the written objection itself, or some sort of precursor document, but uh, they all photographed themselves signing and sent it around with comments. Uh, next up, a section called Covering Your Butt. Would you like to hear about that? The things we do for the orange Jesus, one lawmaker muttered in the Republican cloakroom on the morning of January 6th as he signed hastily drafted petitions objecting to electors from a half dozen states. One Republican who heard the remark, a derisive reference to Mr. Trump, yes, thank you very much, said it had been made by Representative Mark E. Green of Tennessee. But a spokeswoman for Mr. Green said he had heard another lawmaker say it. Anyone could have said it, the spokeswoman wrote in an email. That's because they all probably believed it. In the weeks before January 6th, the vast majority of objectors had publicly sympathized with Mr. Trump's allegations of conspiracy and fraud. Yet when it came time to stake out an official justification for their votes, about three quarters chiefly relied on Mr. Johnson's argument, including 35 who signed a statement that he had written and read aloud at the previous day's meeting. Representative John Rutherford of Florida had described, quote, serious allegations of election fraud and even urged Republican state legislatures to decertify their Biden electors. But after the violence on January 6th, he said he was objecting to make clear his view on state legislatures' roles in setting election rules. It was abundantly clear that former President Joe Biden earned the 270 votes needed to win the Electoral College, he said in a statement at the time. In the end, even some Stop the Steal ringleaders adopted Mr. Johnson's approach. One of them, Representative Brian Babin of Texas, Babin, Babin, I don't know, B-A-B-I-N, had joined a conference call with Mr. Trump four days earlier and posted on social media that, quote, those who aren't with us are against us, unquote, adding history will be unforgiving. Hashtag stop the steal. But then he changed his mind. Others included Representative Ronnie Jackson, a former White House doctor, glug, 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 who had written days earlier in a Texas newspaper that, quote, the fraud that took place on Election Day cannot be allowed to stand as well as Representative Andy Biggs of Arizona, who had asked legislators in his home state to decertify Biden electors. Mr. Mullen, who is now running in Oklahoma for Senate, had called Mr. Biden, quote, illegitimate, posted more than a dozen messages on Twitter stoking stolen election suspicions, and during a Fox News appearance made spurious claims about impossibly large numbers of Democrats voting in Arizona and unreliable voting machines in Michigan. 
During a telephone town hall meeting with seven uh, 6,700 constituents on January 4th, he said Democratic control of Congress would make overturning the election results highly unlikely, but insisted this is worth fighting. That's why we have decided we are going to contest the electoral votes. Yet by January 6th, Mr. Mullen complained only of pandemic-related rule changes. That's called covering your butt said former Senator Barbara Boxer, a California Democrat who had backed the Democrats' objections in 2004. They wanted to be part of the Trump coup, but they wanted a different reason they could sell to the public. Mr. Johnson, in an interview, acknowledged that some lawmakers may have found his approach politically convenient. I am sure it was, he said, but as God is my witness, that was not my objective. He never had any intent to overturn the election. He said, if Trump had won, I would have had the same concerns. Oh, yes, I'm sure. Next up, the Sedition Caucus. Mr. Mullen first overheard chatter on the earpieces of the Capitol Police. Then he saw lawmakers staring at alerts on their phones. Moments later, shortly after 2 p.m., rioters crashed toward the House chamber. Mr. Mullen, armed with that le- uh, with the leg of a hand sanitizer station, you remember that? I guess that's the furniture he broke up. Rushed to help secure the doors. The shattering of glass sounded like gunfire. He later recalled, and the police officers around him shouted, "Shots fired!" as they drew their weapons. Is it worth it? You almost got killed, Mr. Mullen recalled, yelling at the intruders. Then an officer fatally shot one of them, Ashley Babbitt, who was trying to breach a barricaded door. Sir, you did what you had to do, Mr. Mullen told the distraught officer, hugging him. Wow, put that out in an ad. In a television interview months later, Mr. Mullen faulted Republicans, Democrats, also, why not, and the news media, as well as the Trump administration, for using inflammatory language that too easily, quote, turns into anger. All of us are to blame, he said. Mm, not really. But just hours after his close-up view of the assault, Mr. Mullen threw his political weight behind the attacker's cause by voting against the Electoral College results. Representative Bill Pascrell, Democrat of New Jersey, branded the Republicans the Sedition Caucus and accused them of trying to burn down democracy. A few rattled senators backed off of their plans to support the objections after the violence. Mr. Rice said he almost changed his mind about objecting. If a president can send a mob down there to intimidate Congress into doing his bidding, then we might as well not have a Congress, he said in an interview. We might as well have a king. But he ultimately pressed on with the other House objectors. In a two-page memorandum of talking points, Mr. Johnson wrote after the riot to buck up his fellow lawmakers under fire for objecting. He lamented that the violence had almost eclipsed his careful arguments. Most of the country has also never heard the principled reason, he wrote. Next up, money-making machines. See if you can guess who that's about. Key industry donors and trade groups pledged to blackball the objectors in the aftermath of the violence. Remember those heady days? Calling the riot an armed insurrection, which it was, the Real Estate Roundtable said its members were appalled by lawmakers who continue to fuel baseless claims of election fraud by refusing to certify the clear results of last November's election. Comcast said it was suspending contributions to objectors because the peaceful transition of power is a foundation of America's democracy. Toyota described the attack as horrific, and six months later, in the interest of promoting actions that further our democracy, said it would also suspend donations to objectors. Of the 100 largest publicly traded companies in the United States, half pledged to cut off those lawmakers, according to Accountable.us, a liberal group that created a website using campaign finance reports to track the money. But the boycotts were short-lived. At least 33 of those 50 companies have now resumed donating to objectors, the group found. Among them are AT&T, Comcast, and Toyota. The roundtable has also given to the objectors. As of September, Fortune 500 companies and trade groups have contributed more than $27 million to the re-election campaigns of objectors, according to Accountable.us. 
And then there's a graphic in here, a bar graph. Many corporations broke their pledges to stop supporting objectors. Companies donated to 2020 election objectors after pausing all contributions or vowing to end support for the lawmakers involved. And uh, then you can see a bar graph of how much they gave eventually after saying that they weren't going to give any money. Peaking in March of 2022 and I would say June of 2022, where some $400,000 in each month donated to objectors, despite their pledge not to do it. Now, back in April of 2021, there was virtually nothing being given. But whatever. None of it has surprised Representative Tim Burchett of Tennessee, one of the recipients of the corporate giving. I figured around election time, they're going to come back around, he said. And they have. Yuck. Small donors never abandoned the objector's cause. Mr. Trump's political committees raised more than a quarter billion dollars in political donations on the pretext of contesting the election. And he has funneled $5,000 contributions, the maximum allowed, why he obeys the law, I don't know, to about 100 Republican congressional incumbents, most of them objectors. His committees also gave $1 million to the Conservative Partnership Institute, an advocacy group led in part by his former chief of staff. It hosted at least 20 objectors last winter at the Ritz-Carlton on Amelia Island, Florida, where Cleta Mitchell, a lawyer who had played a central role in Mr. Trump's efforts to reverse the 2020 election, hosted a panel discussion. You may remember her voice on the tape of his call to Brad Raffensperger in Georgia. She now leads the Institute's Election Integrity Network, which pushes for tighter voter registration requirements and continues to deny Mr. Trump's defeat. The election was rigged. Trump won, the network posted to Twitter as recently as this summer, and also litter boxes. Election integrity has become central to Republican solicitations for all sorts of issues, from inflation to immigration, because if you don't check that box, you are not relevant said David Ferguson, a Republican consultant who works in online advocacy. And if you voted to certify, that is a negative. The phrase is coded language, said Denver Riggleman, the former Republican congressman from Virginia who has worked with the special House committee investigating the riot. You're implying the election was stolen. In a statement to the Times, the co-founder of the party's Election Integrity Caucus Representative Claudia Tenney of New York said her group sought to restore people's faith in the democratic process, even as they sought to undermine people's faith in the democratic process or erase the democratic process entirely. Taking a cue from Mr. Trump, several objectors have sought to raise campaign money to fight alleged election fraud. Representative Guy Reschenthaler of Pennsylvania, whose justification for objecting was solely procedural, he says, issued an online fundraising appeal on the anniversary of the riot. Will you help me stop the left from stealing our elections? Objectors dominate the list of the most successful campaign committee fundraisers. High-profile newcomers like Ms. Bobert and Ms. Green are money-making machines, Mr. Ferguson said, because their message is what the grassroots really believed. In a sign of how central they have become to the right, objectors make up virtually all the incumbents backed this year by the advocacy group Club for Growth, a titan of conservative campaign money. The group has reported spending more than $17 million directly backing objectors and a similar sum attacking their opponents. Along with smaller sums spent on other objectors, the group's political action committee spent more than $7 million to back Representative Ted Budd in his North Carolina Senate race and $4 million on an unsuccessful Senate bid by Representative Mo Brooks of Alabama. At the rally on the day of the Capitol, Mr. Brooks had urged, quote, American patriots to, quote, start taking down names and kicking ass. He lost his primary to an opponent who also claimed that possible election fraud in 2020 needed further investigation. Except more of it than that other dumb guy, I guess. In newly drawn districts pitting incumbent Republicans against one another in this year's primaries, the club spent $2.1 million helping two objectors, Representatives Mary Miller of Illinois and Alex Mooney of West Virginia, beat opponents who defied Mr. Trump and voted to certify the election. 
Asked about the spending, a spokesman said the group backed candidates who promoted limited government policies, regardless of their position in the 2020 election. In a statement to the Times, the Club for Growth's president, David McIntosh, said every Republican except Cheney and Romney has taken issue with the last election, referring to Ms. Cheney and Senator Mitt Romney, of course, of Utah, another critic of Mr. Trump. David McIntosh, by the way, uh, the originator, I can I think I keep reminding you of this, the originator of what eventually became known as the Istook Amendment. Ernie Istook stole credit for the defund the left effort to uh, disallow um, government grants to uh, or, or disallow lobbying by government grantees. That was the aim of the Mac or the uh, what became the Istook Amendment. But Macintosh was the one along with uh, what's his name Ehrlich from uh, Maryland who eventually I think went on to become governor of Maryland didn't he I can't remember did he win I yeah I think so anyway uh, Macintosh and Ehrlich originated uh, that thing and then um, uh, they were unable to attach it to any of the appropriations bills themselves but Ernie Istook who was on the appropriations committee was able to get votes scheduled on the floor for those uh, that amendment and it ended up becoming the Istook Amendment. Anyway, so now he runs Club for Growth and runs it as a Trumpy idiot, just in case you were wondering. Okay, what else have we got? Another section called Trump Tough. Mr. Rice, alone among the objectors, voted to impeach Mr. Trump for inciting the riot. Sitting in his Capitol Hill office with a reporter, Mr. Rice played a video on an iPad to explain his whipping by a primary challenger who had agreed with him on almost every policy question, but faulted him for betraying the former president. The video was taken four months after Biden's inauguration, recorded at a Myrtle Beach country club where Mr. Rice is a member and has often raised money. It shows L. Lynn Woods, a high-profile champion of Mr. Trump's fraud claims addressing a Republican women's group. Donald J. Trump has never conceded, has he? Because he won the election, Mr. Wood exclaims to loud cheers and applause. Donald J. Trump is still the guy the military will call for the code if they need the first a first strike. Like, yeah, sure, okay. Not that he would have remembered where he put the code, but okay. Exasperated, Mr. Rice put down the iPad. Listen to what this moron says. This is what I was running against. Oh, womp womp. He described gasps of disbelief at a campaign stop at the t same country club when he matter-of-factly declared that Mr. Trump had lost the election. It was painful. In July, he lost this primary after receiving less than a quarter of the vote. In the 2020 general election, he had coasted to victory with 62%. In an interview, Mr. Meyer, who had also voted to impeach and lost his primary, said he was surprised Republicans had not suffered a backlash from voters over the objections and the January 6th riot. He argued that the leftward tilt of the Biden administration had pushed voters back toward Mr. Trump, citing executive orders that stretched the authority of the White House to impose vaccine mandates, an eviction moratorium, and the cancellation of student debt, which didn't come until long after he had lost his primary, but whatever. These massive uses of executive power, he said, make people feel like if you are not with us pushing on the brake pedal, then you are de facto helping the Democratic majority push on the gas. Objectors who doubled down have thrived. Mr. Budd of North Carolina signaled support for Mr. Trump's fraud claims in the weeks after the election by introducing the Combat Voter Fraud Act. As a Republican candidate for the Senate, he warmed up a Trump rally this spring by accusing Democrats of opposing election integrity because, quote, they know they can't win elections on a woke left agenda, unquote. A spokesman for Mr. Budd said he had started pushing for tighter voting registration requirements long before the 2020 election, noting the experience of a major election fraud scandal in his state in 2018, which, of course, uh, you know, in order to the benefit of uh, Republicans, and it had been in a Republican primary, so it had to, but uh, no one really got punished for that one. And by the way, I mean, tighter voter registration requirements has been a staple of Republican campaigning since forever, so it's not like he came up with the idea or anything. He was campaigning out of the box. Uh, well, 
inside the box, but from is removing the contents of the box, from out of the box. You see what I'm talking about. All right. Poor choice of words. In Oklahoma, Mr. Mullen stood out from the pack of Republican Senate candidates by introducing a bill to officially expunge Mr. Trump's second impeachment. It faulted the Democratic impeachment leaders for failing to note the, quote, unusual voting patterns and voting anomalies of the 2020 presidential election, of which there were none, or to understand why Republicans doubted that Mr. Trump had not won re-election. Sorry, I can't get in your stupid heads. The resolution, co-sponsored by more than 30 lawmakers, did not advance, but it curried favor with the former president. In July, Mr. Trump officially endorsed Mr. Mullen. Mullen, who owns a ranch, spent a hot Saturday that same month campaigning among his fellow cattlemen at their annual conference in Norman, Oklahoma. One attendee, Joel Reimer, applauded him for taking a stand against the electoral college count, knowing he would be ridiculed by many for buying into conspiracy theories. Mr. Reimer, who manages a beef ranch, added, From a small-town guy's perspective, I personally had questions about the validity of the vote. And he believes in litter boxes, too. The campaign gave out flyers declaring that, quote, no one in Congress has worked harder to, all caps, save America, and proclaiming Mr. Mullen Trump tough. At the top of the checklist of priorities was the party's new refrain, secure our elections. And that's the end of the article. A couple of acknowledgments for uh, the people on the byline and some additional help in writing the article, I guess. A uh, long slog through that piece, but I think well worth it. And I, I think I learned something out of it, too, that, that I don't think I knew uh, how influential this uh, Mike Johnson was and his, you know, lo- uh, I guess tightrope walking theory. But it makes a lot of sense. Um, for how, well, for just as the uh, title it delivers on the title, how they got there, um, it helps explain. Besides just crying gimme terrianism and pointing to that, which is a valid point, I think, still valid, uh, but helps explain how people can mentally do the gymnastics of saying, "Yeah, I'm on board with the fraud thing," and then in the face of sixty plus losses in court and the declaration from Bill Barr saying, well, I, you know, either rejecting it and changing their mind and saying, well, I actually think that we should just stand on this narrow constitutional grounds or uh, lying and saying that I, they were never for the other thing, as Johnson himself did, or um, just conflating the two. I never said that. Oh, you did say that. You play them. That, OK, well, what I really meant was that when I said stop the steal was that it's a steal to allow the rules to be changed unconstitutionally. That's a steal. That's the steal I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, totally that. It, it's quite fascinating, really. And, uh, well, glad we put it on the record for you and used the fact of an absence here today to bring you this extraordinarily long but interesting and informative article. Well, that was interesting. Uh, here's another thing you might not have guessed. A new article from the Washington Post, which argues that uh, in the Trump White House, classified records were routinely mishandled, according to aides. How do you like that? The jumble of secret and not-so-secret documents found by the FBI was typical of how Donald Trump handled records, former staffers said. This a new article in the Washington Post reported by Shane Harris, Josh Dawsey, Ellen Nakashima and Jacqueline Almany. And, well, let's see what they've got to say here. No surprise, I guess, to all of us. Aides who had worked in Donald Trump's White House were not surprised this summer when the FBI found highly classified material in boxes at Mar-a-Lago mixed with news clippings and other items. They'd seen such haphazard collections before. During his four years in office, Trump never strictly followed the rules and customs for handling sensitive government documents, according to 14 officials from his administration, most of whom spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss what they called Trump's mishandling of classified information. I guess we all expected that that would be the case, even as he was just coming into office. He never pays attention to things like that. He doesn't know the difference between things he owns and things he has uh 
access to by virtue of office or anything like that. He'd never held office before, so he would never know it. He doesn't distinguish between personality and things that uh, are left in his custody. And we should never leave anything in his custody, really. And uh, again, uh, no surprise to anybody, I think, who knew anything about him coming in. And uh, for all the people who insisted, well, you know, sure, he doesn't know what's going on, but he'll have people to handle that. Well, you were wrong, too. Anyway, uh, what do the 14-plus uh, officials have to say about the way he handled things? He took transcripts of his calls with foreign leaders, as well as photos and charts used in his intelligence briefings to his private residence with no explanation. Oh, but he had a whole protocol, I heard, in place for that. He demanded that letters be that he exchanged with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un be kept close at hand so that he could show them off to visitors. I mean, and there's nothing wrong with that while you're president either. Documents that would ordinarily be kept under lock and key mingled with piles of newspaper articles in Trump's living quarters and a dining room that he used as an informal office. I suppose I should say, provided there's nothing classified in the letters from Kim, it's fine if he shows it all. Well, he loves the tchotchkes, as Maggie Haberman says. Anyway, officials and aides who worked in proximity to Trump said they are not sure how many or how more than 300 classified documents ended up at his Mar-a-Lago estate, triggering a lengthy effort to retrieve them that has resulted in a criminal investigation. But in the waning days of his presidency, as Trump grudgingly began to pack up his belongings, he included documents that should have been sent to the National Archives and Records Administration, along with news articles and gifts he received while president, several former officials said. I had a feeling it was going to happen with the gifts. We all saw that coming. What those ex-Trump aides and advisors saw in an inventory of items recovered by the FBI in August, classified documents in boxes, stored alongside newspaper and magazine articles, books and gifts, looked to them like the idiosyncratic filing system, I guess you would have closed that in quotes, that Trump used in the White House, i.e. let some other poor schmuck figure this stuff out. Senior aides said they tried for years to impose some order on the flow of classified information in the White House with little success. The rigor I had felt at the end of meetings during the Obama administration, where someone very carefully collected all the pieces of paper or stayed behind in the room and made sure that there was nothing left, that rigor just did not exist at the end during the Trump period, and probably never at any point during the Trump period, I would guess. Well, that said one former official who regularly attended Situation Room meetings, a longtime advisor who still sees Trump regularly described him as a pack rat and a hoarder. Hey, we all... Maybe you all don't have that problem. I do that a lot too, but I probably wouldn't here. Several former aides said Trump spent his time in office flouting classification rules and intimidating staffers who might try to take secret intelligence material away from him. I can't say what went wrong that resulted in some boxes ending up at Mar-a-Lago. I'll tell you, he stole them. Uh, said a former official who knew that Trump took classified information to his White House quarters, but you can see that as an extension of four years of accommodating the president. A spokesman for Trump declined to comment for this article, other than to repeat a previously issued statement in which he accused the Justice Department of leaking information to the Washington Post to hurt Trump's image. President Trump remains committed to defending the Constitution and the office of the presidency, ensuring the integrity of America for generations to come. That statement said many of Trump's aides had not previously worked in senior government positions and they came to the White House naive about the established procedures for handling classified information on August or in August of 2017. White House Chief of Staff John F. Kelly, a retired Marine Corps general who had served as Secretary of Homeland Security, tried to set things straight. He tried. That was nice of him. Kelly issued written guidance requiring that any document sent to the president for his review first be cleared by the staff secretary, the official in charge of keeping track of documents, as well as the chief of staff. Kelly also set up rules for what to do after Trump had seen a document. All paper leaving the Oval Office must be submitted to the staff secretary for appropriate processing, said the guidance, a copy of which 
was reviewed by the Washington Post. It was the staff secretary's job to mark the document president has seen and submit it to the Office of Records Management. This process is vital for compliance with the Presidential Records Act, the guidance states, referring to the law that makes White House records the property of the federal government. As I'm reading this, I'm thinking, I'm sure Trump, from his private world, was probably all about seeing something that he thought was interesting and then worrying about whether he would be able to find it again if it became necessary to wave it in someone's face or to brag on or to prove something from an argument. And he didn't want to let things go. But there's a whole apparatus there where, you know, you can say to you can talk to your aides about it and say, I saw something the other day that was about this subject. I don't remember exactly what the date was, but it was, I guess, I don't know, a week or two ago. And so and so brought it in. Of course, he might not have the memory for that, but they track that stuff down. There's a whole file of, you know, stamped president has seen. I want you to look in the president has seen pile and find me that thing. Get me that information. People will do that, but, you know, he's still working as a pack rat individual. I'll stow, I'll stow it away somewhere, and then I'll be able to not find it later when I need it. You know how that goes. Anyway, uh, so that was the guidance, and he paid no attention to it. It wasn't perfect, but we did have a better idea of what was going on, going and coming, said a former senior administration official. The White House normally establishes a chain of custody for classified documents, said Larry Pfeiffer, the senior director of White House Situation Room in the Obama administration and a former CIA chief of staff. They log the documents, they track them, they give them numbers. If anyone says, hey, whatever happened to that memo given to the president, the staff secretary can say, hey, it's in the National Security Advisor's office. Former officials credited Kelly and then Staff Secretary Rob Porter who didn't he get kicked out of the White House for gambling problems and then get brought back somehow, as well as his successor, Derek Lyons, with trying to impose some order on Trump's chaotic ways. But it was a struggle. John Bolton, a former national security advisor to Trump, said Trump sometimes asked to keep material after intelligence briefings with no clear pattern as to what he wanted. Sometimes Bolton said he would ask the president to give documents back. It was very erratic, he said. Some things would catch his attention and other things wouldn't. And it's probably if there was any, you know, if there's any nudity in it, that's probably something he would want to keep. But I don't know why there would be. But I'm guessing that would capture his attention. Kelly said Trump rejected the Presidential Records Act entirely. So what? Right. He added that many people would regularly say to him, we have to capture these things. Well, I prefer things that don't get captured, he probably said. But what he did doesn't surprise me at all, Kelly said. Two Trump advisors said he took or had his aides take all the documents he wanted to the private dining room or the residence. These documents were not usually closely tracked, one of the people said. One former official said some classified documents in the residence were visible to anyone passing by, though I assume fewer people pass by in the residence. Although it was not necessarily improper for a president to take classified information to the residents to continue working. Yeah, (laughs) that's kind of dumb, but okay. And White House staffers are accustomed to adjusting to any president's working style and preference. It was not always clear that Trump needed the documents for official business, another former official said. White House staffers found ways to accommodate Trump's demands. The letters he exchanged with Kim, for example, were not stored in the White House space customarily used for sensitive documents, but were kept where aides could quickly retrieve them at Trump's request, like a Diet Coke. The letters were among the first items flagged, or rather, yes, the items first flagged as missing by the archives after Trump left office and were included in the 15 boxes of material sent back from Mar-a-Lago in January. I had a feeling that the uh, archivists really wanted to see those things. Aides also found other ways to circumvent Trump's sticky fingers, as one put it. I mean, I know what it means, but it's Trump. White House staffers retrieved from the residents documents that Trump had torn into pieces, then reassembled the papers and returned them to secure facilities so that they could be preserved as presidential records. Others who routinely briefed Trump said they developed a practice of never leaving classified documents in his possession unless he demanded them. 
Several former officials said they knew that the system, or lack of one, for handling classified information carried risks. Sensitive documents could get lost. Intelligence might fall into the hands of people not authorized to see it. But Trump intimidated his aides. They didn't challenge him, one former official said. He'll have people to take care of that, but he'll bully them into not taking care of it. Anyway, several people singled out Mark Meadows, who became Trump's chief of staff in March 2020 and stayed through the end of his term as incapable of telling the president no. And that's how he remained chief of staff. That set a tone that others followed, these people said. This characterization is completely absurd, said Ben Williamson, a Meadows spokesman. In the absence of higher authority backing them up, personnel in the staff secretary's office could not be expected to remove documents from the president's possession, another former aide said. They would have gotten their heads cut off by the president if they tried to take things from him. I would like to have seen some of it. I mean, no one's going to do it, but I wonder... Like, suppose it had escalated into a series of physical altercations and the president is like sending bruised people, battered and beaten and bleeding out of the White House. Does that not reach? I just, you know, I hope that would never happen, but I'm just wondering what, what would, because I don't put it past him. And I, although, you know, I don't really think he would do it either because ultimately he's chicken. But OK, anyway, uh, moving on to the next section here. Whatever fragile discipline Kelly and others tried to instill began to disintegrate after the 2020 election. The usual packing process that occurs during a presidential transition was delayed because Trump would not concede that he had lost re-election and did not want to move out of the White House. Two former administration officials said many officials who by then had some experience with security procedures had left the White House to be replaced by less seasoned personnel who did not understand classification rules and were afraid to say no to the president, former officials said, even though he was about to not be president. They were still afraid. This created the opportunity for mistakes to happen, and, and they did happen, and I don't know if they were mistakes. One of the former officials said, What the president's intent was is the key question. Not always. The former official said of the transfer of classified material to Mar-a-Lago. I don't think so. As Trump dug in his heels, officials in the staff secretary's office tried unsuccessfully to find some sensitive documents that they believed were still in his possession. With the White House expected to hand over all original relevant documents to the archives, senior administration officials held several conversations about missing materials, former officials said. Lyons, the staff secretary, and some White House aides discussed places in the residence and elsewhere in the White House where Trump could be keeping the documents, as well as gifts he had accumulated. Hmm. There was no exact list of everything that had gone missing, one of the former officials said, but we knew the places he usually worked and the other senior people who might have had the documents, the officials said. Their efforts to find the missing materials were hampered by a lack of senior leadership. Some said Meadows had no experience managing the flow of classified documents inside the White House. In late December, Lyons, who had tried to do that, stepped down from his position as staff secretary and was not replaced. The office's functions were downgraded. A former senior administration official said there wasn't a deputy, so Mark took over the office. Meadows told aides in the final days of Trump's presidency that he would handle retrieving some of the documents from Trump, but he never did. According to a former senior administration official with this direct knowledge of the matter, those records weren't collected. The former official said a Meadows spokesman disputed this characterization, but they were found in Mar-a-Lago, so they obviously weren't collected, so you're a liar, you lose. Eventually, with his efforts to overturn the election results gaining little to no traction in state houses or courts, Trump began the process of packing up. It was in those harried final days that aides said he and others put briefing books, gifts, news clippings, and other possessions into boxes, some in the residence and others in different locations throughout the White House. Other materials were already in boxes, probably all the M&Ms, I would guess. Some White House lawyers took note of the two dozen boxes of documents in the residence and suggested that Trump turn them over, according to an email from the archives viewed by the Post. When archives officials ultimately found extensive classified materials in boxes returned to them from Mar-a-Lago, it was a surprise to some of his advisors, including White House counsel Pat Cibaloni, 
you know, Pat Cipollone, and his deputy, Pat Philbin, according to a person familiar with the matter. I, that's the story I would plant, too, guys. Don't worry about it. We had no idea what was in those boxes, said a lawyer with knowledge of the packing. But not enough, I guess. At least one lawyer for Trump's political group, Alex Cannon, we just learned about that guy, was so concerned about what was in the boxes sent to Mar-a-Lago that in late 2021, he told other Trump aides not to handle the boxes or their contents, according to two people who spoke to Cannon. After 15 boxes were transferred from Mar-a-Lago to the archives in January, Trump asked Cannon to declare that all the material belonging uh, being sought by the agency had been returned. But Cannon, as we know, declined because he wasn't sure it was true, the Post reported on Monday. Among Trump's aides and staffers, no one knew what was really in the boxes, one person involved in Trump's legal effort said. The former senior administration official who said Meadows took over as the de facto staff secretary bemoaned the lack of preparation for the transition. The plan should have been to figure out what all he had. That's good grammar. I'd say, you know, it's vernacular grammar. What all he had, what needed to go back and to get relevant senior administration officials to help the staff secretary's office in getting as much as they could back. That didn't happen. The former official said there was no plan to do it because Derek was gone and people were looking for other jobs and trying to survive day by day. That is some story. No surprise, of course, just uh, another in the um, pile of amazing nonsense that uh, Donald Trump continues to be able to get away with somehow. Well, now may be a good time for us to transition to something completely different. How about a piece that our good friend Darwin has read for us and did so a while back here on the reverse freedom rides that uh, we read a little bit about in the immediate aftermath of the DeSantis arranged flights of migrants from Texas to Florida to Martha's Vineyard. We learned about uh, or rediscovered, if you're lucky enough to remember these things for the first time they happened, the buses full of uh, black families uh, essentially rounded up and lured onto the buses and deported off to Hyannisport with the promise that they would be dropped off outside of the Kennedy compound where the president would greet them and then set them up with uh, a nice new life up north. Well... Uh, that was the racist origins of uh, DeSantis's migrant program, I guess. And uh, anyway, uh, but Darwin had something to add to that and wanted to read one of the great articles on the subject and then did something very interesting. So he sent me two versions, by the way. Uh, one, uh, a straight read, which, uh, you know, was fine. And uh, ordinarily, this was really interesting. So one was a straight read and one he put a, a musical soundtrack under and he kind of said I, I he says i kind of like the one with the the music the the vibey music behind it and uh, i i like the idea too and it's a it's a great thought now i'm thinking okay well two things could happen now, one um if i do the one without the soundtrack you see then i can edit things a little bit and i usually don't edit out any of the substance but i you know clean up your recordings and uh, you know there are a few ums and ahs as there are in all of my recordings but i want to make you sound smarter than me so i try to clean those things up and and it, you know it compresses the time that's necessary to include the story doesn't waste anything unnecessarily and makes you sound like you have a put together presentation but with the music in there you can't chop that up that way because then the music sounds weird and disjointed. And now it occurs to me, uh, what about the uh, copyright on the music? Like what music got used? Now I kind of have to, I think I might have to ask about this. We'll see now what happens. Uh, and you'll know the results shortly. Uh, except if I choose not to play the thing, I probably won't play this clip either. So I don't know. Well, let's see what happens. See if I go get my answer. Now this is the beauty of doing these things ahead of time. Hi there, everyone. This is Darwin Darko reporting today as your senior black correspondent. Reading today from WGBH.org. This is a Boston radio station. It's apparently their local uh, NPR station. And this is an article from 2019 by uh, Gabrielle Emanuel. She begins, The Long Journey North, The Forgotten Story of the Reverse Freedom Rides of 1962. 
After three days on a Greyhound bus, Layla Mae Williams was just an hour from her destination, Hyannis, Massachusetts. When she asked the bus driver to pull over, she needed to change into her finest clothes. She had been promised the Kennedys would be waiting for her. It was late on a Wednesday afternoon nearly 60 years ago when that Greyhound bus from Little Rock, Arkansas pulled into Hyannis. It slowed to a stop near the summer home of President John F. Kennedy and his family. When the doors opened, Leela May and her nine youngest children stepped onto the pavement. Reporters' microphones pointed at her, their cameras trained on her family. The photographs in the next day's newspaper show Leela May looking immaculate. In an elegant black dress, a triple string of pearls and a white hat, she was dressed up to start a new life. She was going to have a job, and she was going to be able to support her family, one of Leela May's daughters, Betty Williams, remembered in a recent interview, her first on the topic. Before coming north to Massachusetts, Leela May had been promised a good job, good housing, and a presidential welcome. But President Kenny was not there to meet her. Margaret Mosley was. Throughout the summer and fall of 1962, Mosley welcomed a steady stream of African Americans like Leela May to Cape Cod. What Mosley knew, and Leela May didn't, was that there was no job and no permanent housing waiting for her in Hyannis. Mosley knew Leela May and others were pawns in a segregationist game. It was one of the most inhumane things I have ever seen, said Mosley, a longtime civil rights activist, in a televised interview a few years before her death. Fuming over the civil rights movement, Southern segregationists had concocted a way to retaliate against Northern liberals. In 1962, they tricked about 200 African Americans from the South into moving North. The idea was simple. When large numbers of African Americans showed up on Northern doorsteps, Northerners would not be able to accommodate them. They would not want them. The hypocrisy of Northern liberals would be exposed. The reverse freedom rides have largely disappeared from the country's collective memory. The scheme almost never appears in history books and is little known even in Hyannis, the primary target of the ploy. But today, with racial tensions re-inflamed, and today as in 2019, but today with racial tensions re-inflamed, some hear echoes of that segregationist past in America's present. And for the family that came north based on a lie, the journey has cast an enduring shadow on their lives. 100 years after the Civil War, the North and the South were still caught in a vicious struggle over civil rights. In the summer of 1961, black and white activists boarded Greyhound buses and crisscrossed the South with the goal of integrating seating on interstate buses and in bus terminals. Southern segregationists, who were still furious over the school desegregation fights that dominated in the 1950s, saw the Freedom Riders as no more than sanctimonious provocateurs. When the buses pulled into cities across the South, they were greeted by mobs armed with bats and firebombs. In a television interview from the time, Ned Touchstone of Louisiana, a spokesperson for a local segregationist group, said the North was sending down busloads of people here with the express purpose of violating our laws, fomenting confusion, trying to destroy 100 years of workable tradition and good relations between the races. Touchstone and other segregationists thought there was no way the Freedom Riders or their fellow Northern liberals actually cared about integration, interstate transit, or advancing civil rights. Instead, they were convinced it was all a strategy to embarrass the South and capture black votes. The segregationists decided to answer the Freedom Rides with reverse Freedom Rides. They would use the same weapon, the Greyhound bus, and send African Americans to Northern cities. And then they see if the North liked it when blacks suddenly showed up in their backyard. For many years, certain politicians, educators, and certain religious leaders have used the white people of the South as a whipping boy, to put it mildly, to further their own ends and their political campaigns, said Amos uh, Guthridge, a small-time lawyer from Louisiana who helped spearhead the reverse freedom rides. We're going to find out if people like Ted Kennedy and the Kennedys, all of them, really do have an interest in the Negro people, really do have a love for the Negro. The segregationists tapped into a network of local groups called Citizens' Councils. Despite the sanitized name, the councils were the Ku Klux Klan, without the hoods and the masks, said historian Clive Webb. Webb, a professor at the University of Sussex in England, specializes in studying races. He said he's the type of historian who wants to wash his hands after he's been in the archives. Fifteen years ago, he published the first and still the only major academic article on the reverse freedom riders. According to Webb, the citizens' councils attempted to cloak their racism in respectability. They held meetings in fancy downtown hotels and wore suits and ties. They could be members of the police force, said Webb. They could be bankers, businessmen, and the like. 
These men went to great lengths to make an official campaign for something many saw as a publicity stunt. There was an advertising effort with flyers and radio commercials to attract African Americans to accept the bus tickets. Their ideal recruit was a single mother with many children or a man with a criminal past. They targeted people who were either welfare recipients or prison inmates, said Webb. People who were placing a burden as they saw it on public resources. Next, they sought media attention. George Singleman of Louisiana, who claimed credit for the original idea, had once worked in a newsroom. He made sure to alert the press. Negro ride plan stirs new furor, read a front uh, page headline in the New York Times. The Boston Herald added, 14 more jobless Negroes sent north. As spring rolled into summer and then into fall, nearly daily articles chronicled the scheme as it unfolded. Relishing the coverage, Guthridge said in an interview, if it takes two weeks, two months, two years, five or ten years, we will continue it until the white people up there tell those politicians we are tired of using the American Negro for a pawn just for their votes. But when talking to reporters, the segregationists were not always so transparent about their motives. They offered ever-changing justifications for the scheme. Guthridge claimed the idea was born of a Christian charity. We began this program in a spirit of beneficence and humanitarianism, he declared in one interview. Touchstone said his primary motivation was to bring about a more equitable distribution of the colored population. He added that African Americans were begging for assistance. Is it a crime to help people who come to you and say, boss man, I want to go to the north, he said. <laughs> Is that what it sounded like? Singleman cited a great American tradition as the tradition as the rationale for the reverse freedom rides. Our forefathers put everything in their possession into covered wagons and went out across the plains. In those days, it was rugged Americanism. Now today, for some reason or other, it's been frowned upon. I don't understand it, he said. Their actual motives revealed when the TV cameras were off and a decade and a half had passed were far more sinister. There's something in the black makeup that when they get to 11, 12 years of age, their learning ability comes to a grinding halt, Singleman said in an oral history interview. Lying, cheating, toting, and stealing, that's the only thing they're good for. It was the racist mindset that made Singleman confident the Northerners would reject those sent their way. He was relying on an assumption that Northerners uh, were just as racist as he was, but more opp opportunistic. The Citizens Council had envisioned sending thousands north, but in reality, far fewer made the journey. A couple hundred African Americans, mostly from Arkansas and Louisiana, accepted the tickets to New York, New Hampshire, Indiana, Idaho, Minnesota, California, and elsewhere. The largest number, exactly 96, arrived at the makeshift bus stop closest to the Kennedy Summer White House in Cape Cod. For Leela May and her children, Massachusetts was far, far away from the Williams home in rural Arkansas. So that is a snapshot of this article. It's a pretty long article. They really focus in on this Williams family. Uh, and there's also some videos to accompany it. I suggest you folks check it out. Thanks for listening. This is Darwin underscore Darko. Thanks for listening. And back to you, David. Okay, so I guess we have our answer. It did, in fact, work, and we're going to cross our fingers and hope that uh, the music is, in fact, royalty-free. And Darwin says it was marked that way anyway, and it's out there on YouTube. So, you know, if YouTube's going to get mad and ban our uh, broadcast because we used material that their site said was royalty-free, why, I'll, I don't know. Well, we'll fix it. Don't worry about it, because, of course, we have the version without the music, so we can always just substitute that in and repost the thing. Anyway, so now you have your answer. It's going to work out just fine. I hope you enjoyed it with the music. I kind of like the idea. Way early, like maybe the first couple of shows that we ever tested out for Kegro in the Morning, actually, probably before we even came up with the fantastic name of Kegro in the Morning, I did, in fact, use a musical bed underneath things, but then I realized that I was using copyrighted music and it wasn't going to work. And also, then you couldn't edit very much either. Uh, so I abandoned that practice. But I thought this was kind of cool. And, you know, like uh, nobody told him to put the music in there. He just decided he wanted to have it. So that was kind of cool rule breaking. So we said, let's do that. Anyway, uh, all right. Let's see if we can add one more story here. Here's one that might be perfectly appropriate for the day or inappropriate depending, I mean, I guess, on whether or not you think everybody ought to be repenting on this day. 
It's in Salon Magazine, and it, too, is from Amanda Marcotte. She makes uh, the show, I think, twice this week already with this headline, Ginny Thomas and the Oath Keepers signal the no regrets phase of January 6th apologia. So very interesting on the Day of Atonement to see that they won't be atoning for any of this. Marjorie Taylor Greene, whom we know as Murdery Trader Greene, and Donald Trump also spent the weekend justifying political violence. Which weekend? Last weekend. This was published on October 3rd. Let's get through it here. Ginny Thomas is sticking to the big lie, even when testifying before the January 6th committee, which you're not supposed to do. Definitely not. We still don't know her exact phrasing, but reports from members of the January 6th committee indicate that the right-wing activist and wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas reiterated during her testimony last week the false belief that President Joe Biden stole the 2020 election from Donald Trump. Whether or not she was sincere in this claim is hard to discern. She also told the committee she never speaks about her extensive political activism with her husband, a claim so implausible that it casts doubt on the truthfulness of anything at all that she said during an interview in which she was not put under oath. By the way, just legally speaking, if she speaks to this uh, speaks to Clarence about this, if he knows. I mean, I don't know whether he really knows this, but uh, you can't lie to Congress whether you're under oath or not. You can be charged with perjury, a very different, I mean, similar but separate crime, if you were under oath and lied. If you were not under oath and simply lied to Congress, you'll just be charged with lying to Congress, which is a different infraction. But anyway, they won't charge her because she is who she is. Telling the January 6th committee that you still believe the big lie may seem on its surface to be a really bad idea, but there may be a method to the madness here. It's so crazy it just might work. After all, Ginny Thomas was deeply involved in Trump's attempted coup in 2020, as shown by a bevy of text messages to Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, and emails to swing state legislators urging them to throw out the results of the election. Unable to plead innocence, Thomas may have decided the better course of action is to argue that her actions were justified by a sincere belief in the big lie. Thomas is not alone in going this route. On Monday, opening arguments kicked off in the high-profile trial of Stuart Rhodes and other four members, or four other members of the far-right Oath Keepers, who are accused of seditious conspiracy for their extensive role in organizing the storming of the Capitol on January 6th. Like Thomas, there's just way too much text message and email evidence for the Oath Keepers to deny their actions or intentions. Instead, they're going to argue their behavior was justified by the belief that the election was stolen and that Trump told them to do it. Rhodes's attorney has said that his client will eventually take the stand to argue that he believed Trump was going to invoke the Insurrection Act and call up a militia, whatever militia that might be, which Rhodes had been calling on him to do to stop Biden from becoming president, reports the Associated Press, as Mike Giglio, I don't know whether he says it that way or Giglio, but as he explained in The New Yorker, or maybe New Yorker, I don't know, you tell me. The defense strategy is to argue that the pre-planning of the insurrection was not only legal, but patriotic. Well, that's no surprise. Even when the riot was going on, Trump and his allies were strategizing about how to spin the insurrection and the efforts to overthrow the election that preceded the violent assault on the Capitol. As insurrectionists were still battling Capitol Police, the text message log from Meadows shows that both Trump advisor Jason Miller and Representative Murdery Trader Green were brainstorming lies that Trump and his team could tell to deflect blame. Miller suggested falsely claiming that the rioters were likely Antifa or some other crazed leftists, a lie that ended up getting leveraged at various times by right-wing pundits over the next year and a half. But the Trumpist line on January 6th has slowly been morphing from it wasn't us to it was justified for months now. The effort is led by Trump himself, who struggles to conceal his pride over January 6th, which demonstrated his immense power over many of his followers. 
In recent months, and especially after the FBI raided Mar-a-Lago to retrieve classified documents Trump illegally removed, Trump has only doubled down on his unsubtle view that violence is a useful tool to get what he wants. He's escalating the threatening language and demonizing attacks on anyone he perceives as an obstacle to his power, a strategy no one can, in good faith, pretend isn't serious after January 6th. Friday night, last Friday, Trump did it again, releasing a diatribe on social media accusing Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell of having a, quote, and in all caps, death wish, and making a racist joke about McConnell's wife. Like, for good measure, we'll throw that in. As he usually does, Trump adopted a passive tone when talking about violence against his perceived enemies, pretending he's just, quote, predicting bad things will befall them and that he's not encouraging such things. At a Saturday rally, he also praised Thomas for continuing to back the big lie, furthering the no regrets messaging around January 6th. Taylor Green was even less subtle at the very same rally. Democrats want Republicans dead and they have already started the killings. I told you about that one. She uh, she declared this using the language she used was conspiratorial with echoes of the QAnon conspiracy theory cult that she is heavily connected to. But the case she used to justify this false accusation appears to have been a drunken fight in North Dakota. This is different from the one I told you about the other day that she also got wrong where somebody was canvassing about abortion and was told to leave the property and wouldn't do it, and somebody fired a warning shot at him, that went bad. But a different part of the accusation of the killings that had already begun appears to have been a, about a drunken fight in North Dakota. It's linked in the text if you want to take a look, which is not at all a sign that there's been some kind of go signal for Democrats to start killing Republicans. The same, however, cannot be said of Taylor Greene's comments. On the contrary, speeches like hers should be understood as incitement to violence. As Mark Fullman explained in the most recent edition of Mother Jones magazine, rhetoric like this is what experts call stochastic terrorism, whereby a leader vilifies a person or group in ways likely to instigate random supporters to attack those targets, while the instigator maintains a veneer of plausible deniability. Fullman has been carefully documenting Trump's tendency to wish for violence or use of violence excusing language, and the escalation in the past few weeks has been alarming. By the way, at this point, I'd like to throw something else in there because there was another term that was thrown out there for describing what she had done, which I thought was very interesting. I'll just throw it in as a uh, parenthetical comment here. It comes from Seth Kotlar, who teaches U.S. history at Willamette University. I know how to pronounce that now. Uh, and uh, among other things, I guess, just, but in his uh, Twitter uh, profile, he notes that that is the case. And he takes the same clip from Murdery Trader Green and says that the term for this sort of rhetoric, he has a different um, description of it. The term for this sort of rhetoric is accusation in a mirror. I thought that was really interesting. I mean, it's basically a, a kind of way of restating the every Republican accusation is a confession thing. But that's sort of a catchy phrase, accusation in a mirror. And scholars of genocide, he goes on to say, identify it as a major warning sign when political leaders start talking like this. I thought that was really interesting and, and worth noting. But now back to Amanda Marcotte's article here, taken together. A disturbing picture is emerging. There's an acceleration both in intimations of violence and justifications for it. No doubt Thomas would deny that her reiterating a belief in the big lie contributes to an atmosphere of political violence, but there is no way around that fact. If you really do believe that democracy is being stolen by Democrats, then that justifies violence. Indeed, that's a huge reason the big lie was invented in the first place, to give a moral context, a moral pretext, rather, to immoral efforts to overthrow the democratic system. The doubling down on the big lie by figures like Thomas and the Oath Keepers, in turn, suggests that Trump's biggest fans think it's still a useful tool to give cover 
to otherwise inexcusable actions. Well, perhaps we have time for one more story. We'll see if we can squeeze in this piece from Grid News that uh, will put some more names on our radar. And as things progress with the January 6th committee and the trials, perhaps these names will come up and we'll have a little background in them. Meet the Kramers. I I imagine it's Kramer. It could be Kramer, I suppose. K-R-E-M-E-R. Meet the Kramers. Leaders of MAGA group Women for America First in the crosshairs of a January 6th grand jury. And the subheader tells us that Amy and her daughter Kylie Jane were key organizers for Trump's January 6th rally. Now they're facing inquiries from a growing number of federal probes. Jason Palladino reports for us here. This back from September 15th. It's been in pocket for a while. So I thought today was a good day to pull it out. A federal grand jury investigating the former president's efforts to overturn the 2020 election has subpoenaed a small group that played a huge role in the events of January 6, 2021. The little-known group Women for America First and its activist founders were key facilitators of Donald Trump's January 6 ellipse rally, who appeared to have had inside information on Trump's secret plans for the day. They had previously organized bus tours and other protests that spread baseless stolen election propaganda. To date, transparency has largely eluded the group. Organized as a dark money entity, Women for America First is not required to disclose detailed donor information. The IRS does not show any tax returns for the group, which could disclose details of its finances and inner workings. The agency has struggled with processing backlogs and did not respond to inquiries from GRID. Women for America First did not respond to inquiries for this story, including a request to produce copies of its tax returns as required by law. The activists, Amy and Kylie Jane Creamer, founded Women for America First in 2019. The mother-daughter duo has remarkable ties to key Trump world figures, including former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, and, you'll never guess, my pillow founder Mike Lindell, who has reportedly helped fund the group's activities. The Kramers, Meadow, Meadows and Lindell, did not respond to requests for comment for this story. After Trump's election loss, the Kramers swiftly emerged as the most effective propagators of the big lie that the election was stolen from Trump. I've not really heard very much about them, although I I think I've heard their names mentioned in connection with this group as the ellipse organizers. Amy Kramer, a self-described extremist MAGA Republican, confirmed her group received a grand jury subpoena in a tweet Saturday. Not the subpoena wasn't in a tweet. Their confirmation was in a tweet. In addition to the January 6th Trump rally, the Kramers and their group produced smaller rallies in the nation's capital in November and December of 2020, also focused on baseless claims of a stolen election. The group also organized March for Trump bus tours to boost the president's stolen election claims. Harriet, uh, I'm sorry, Harmeet Dillon, the group's lawyer, not Harriet, Harmeet, confirmed that the grand jury subpoena seeks information on communications the group had from October 2020 through January of 2021, as well as information about the January 6th rally. A political action committee established by Amy has neglected to file required reporting to the Federal Election Commission, resulting in tens of thousands of dollars of fines and an enforcement referral. They're not reporting to anybody. The PAC, Women Vote Smart, has not filed required disclosures since January of 2020, according to the FEC's records. The group faces over $65,000 in fines, and the FEC has referred the case, the case says, multiple, to the Treasury Department for enforcement and collection. Women Vote Smart is a repeat offender, said Stuart McPhail, uh, Senior Litigation Counsel at Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, an ethics watchdog, you know, crew. Unfortunately, these automatic fines are one of the few forms of enforcement remaining at the FEC, which regularly deadlocks on proceeding with any more serious violations. Such oversights may be common for groups run by political newcomers, but that wouldn't describe the Kramers. 
Amy, in particular, has an extensive background in far-right Republican organizing and a Rolodex to match. She's no stranger to election finance headaches either. An abortive, hmm, interesting choice of word, an abortive run for Congress in 2016 collapsed when her staff reportedly resigned en masse because she couldn't pay her bills. She doesn't pay, she doesn't report. How does she become a big-time person? Amy's daughter, Kylie, brought an apparent knack for social media to their efforts. A Stop the Steal Facebook group Kylie created became one of the fastest growing in Facebook's history, according to the New York Times. And who knows, maybe thanks to Russians, who knows? It added 320,000 users in less than 22 hours before Facebook shut it down for inciting violence. The Justice Department is only the most recent entity to train its focus on the Kramer's activities surrounding the 2020 election. The duo and their operations have previously received subpoenas from the House January 6th Committee and inquiries from the Federal Election Commission. Women for America First has denied any involvement in the U.S. Capitol siege that immediately followed its rally, coincidentally, I guess, spurred on by uh, the... Text keeps jumping around because Grid likes those kinds of ads, I guess. Uh, where were we at this? Oh, yes. So Women for America First denied any involvement in the Capitol siege that immediately followed its rally, spurred on by rally speakers, including Trump himself. But public reporting and information released by the January 6th committee appears to call those denials into question. According to material released by the January 6th committee, two days before the rally and Capitol siege, Kylie Jane Kramer texted Lindell that Trump was secretly planning to move the rally crowd from the ellipse to the Capitol. This stays only between us. We are having a second stage at the Supreme Court again after the ellipse. POTUS is going to have us march there slash the Capitol, Kramer texted. It can not get out about the second stage. She indicated, oh, it's out now. She indicated she was concerned about getting in trouble with the National Park Service, like someone else would subpoena her and she would respond to that. The National Park Permit explicitly disallowed an, quote, organized march. That we've heard. Kylie and Amy's rhetoric promoting their January 6th rally appeared to mimic Trump's inflammatory style in a quote, Tweet of Trump's now infamous Be There Will Be Wild tweet. Kylie wrote, The Calvary, which she meant cavalry, but uh, who knows? She was distracted by the church, I guess. The Calvary is coming, Mr. President. January 6th, Washington, D.C. The tweet is still pinned to the top of her Twitter profile. Then there was, in the next section here, the Stop the Steal bus tour. The Kramer's stolen election activism began almost immediately after state officials reported vote totals and news organizations announced Trump had lost the 2020 election. The Kramer's organized a 20-city bus tour. I doubt it, really, but which featured a rotating mix of speakers spreading stolen election claims, often with incendiary and even outright violent rhetoric. One speaker, Cowboys for Trump founder Coy Griffin, who was recently kicked out of office, right, later participated in the January 6th riot, was convicted of trespassing charges stemming from his involvement and recently removed as a New Mexico county commissioner because of his role in the insurrection. BuzzFeed News found that at each stop, speakers would use increasingly threatening language, invoking revolution and armed rebellion. When they come for my kids with this non-tested COVID vaccine, how did we get to that? I'm going to give them an insurance policy courtesy of a Glock on their forehead. And I don't want to do that, guys. I'm not inciting violence. <laughs> That's some try attempted backing out. Cordy Williams, wearing a 1776 Forever Free shirt told a crowd in Wisconsin just a month before the Capitol siege at a Women for America First event. The Kramers have long ties to January 6th figures, including Meadows, whom Amy reportedly helped win election to Congress in 2012. After the Ellipse rally, many attendees followed suggestions by Trump and other speakers to descend on the Capitol. In other words, he set the insurrection on foot. I keep coming back to that. Once there, violence broke out almost immediately, engulfing the historic campus in bloodshed, chemical spray, and panic. The Kramers appear not to have followed the crowd, but instead retreated to their suite at the Willard Hotel, 
where they and their guests reportedly noshed on room service and sipped champagne and watched TV coverage of law enforcement struggling to regain control of the Capitol complex. Cheese and charcuterie should be here at 6 p.m. and dinner around 7 p.m. Amy reportedly texted two fellow rally organizers around 5.30 that evening. From Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The Kegro in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Wasn't that just darling everybody? Charcuterie after the riot. Well, okay, that wraps it up for today. Hope you enjoyed today's pre recorded show. We actually ran a little bit long, which is a little bit unusual. We'll be back live tomorrow, having repented of everything, only to uh, start running up the tab for next year. We'll see you then.